it's global tv talk show thank you again for being on the show today is 15 july the year is flying by isn't it i think the earth is actually spinning faster than it did last month you know that wouldn't not, surprise the, me my, my hair is getting whiter and whiter day by day <laughs> And our special guest today is in the Detroit market, and his Barbara Bolt. Hello. Hello, Ed. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, why don't you say what your primary business is? I know it's communications with a, uh, a laser focus on international executives. You're right. I'll give you my, my little elevator pitch here. Yes. Uh, I help non-native English speaking executives and managers acquire the leadership communication skills they need in English to either rock their role or advance to the next level. Rock their role. I love that. So that's, <laughs> that's an elevator pitch. Uh, yeah. It's a very brief one. Yes. Yes. So I had a speech coach uh, on my show a couple of years ago and um she told me that I needed to come up with a slogan and you ought to be able to explain whatever you do and you do a lot, she says, but you ought to explain it in seven seconds. That's quick. I don't know how long I just took. I it know. was longer than seven, but I, I seven wasn't seconds. counting. Um, so, <laughs> so she says, you don't know what you do, do you? She said this to me. Now she's mm -hmm. and I friendly. And so um, I said, okay, tell me. <laughs> right. He says, he says, you bring people together. Seven seconds. That's fewer. But so she says, you got to come up with something sexier. Okay. Yes. So you say, we are link makers. There you go. L-I-N-K hyphen M-A-K-E-R-S and then trademark it. So I did that day. Wow. So cool. now you'll, you'll be seeing that. Okay. Uh, hey, hey, what do you do? I'm a link maker. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do LinkedIn? Oh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. And so it starts a conversation. Right. Definitely. Definitely. That's what you want. So sure. you should narrow that 20 second commercial that you just did. Down to seven seconds. Well, try 11. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ed. You're giving me a few extra seconds there. Well, it's true, though, because concise and memorable is what you want to be when you speak. And because I work with people whose first language is in English, that always tends up, ends up being a mouthful non-native English speakers or people whose first language is in English. And I've never come up with a really concise, sexy way of communicating that. So, so it's it. like... Um... Shining shoes. I mean, you can do it the long way. Uh, you can take the brush and uh, you know, slap on the paste. Yeah, you know, there, there's a w different ways of doing the same old things. And, and so it's a matter of, well, it's like, for instance, when I talk with international people, they always want me to slow down. Mm, yep, definitely. Right? Now, why is that? It's because... Uh, you would probably want them to slow down if you understood their mother tongue too. It's the ear. It's what we're accustomed to hearing. Mm -hmm. And if we're not accustomed to hearing even an accent, it can be very difficult for us to catch the sounds. It, interestingly, some people have a harder time with that than others. It was interesting to me when I lived and worked in Italy, you know, Italian is a phonetic language. What, what does that mean? It means that what you see is what you say. It's you. It's pronounced very s similar to the way the word is spelled. Well, but not chow, like C-H-O-W. That's a little bit of a, an exam. Yeah, an um, exception. But like latte, L-A-T-T-A, or L-A-T-T-E. That, that means latte. milk. Milk? Yeah, milk, right. Um, so it, it, and it has to do with the number of sounds a language has in it. Italian doesn't have that many sounds, especially vowel sounds. They are, I can't remember the exact number, but there are five basic vowel sounds and then there are a few diphthong sounds. But a language like Swedish has like 30 different vowel sounds. 
And they are, the Swedes are really good at understanding other people speaking in different ways because their ear is very used to picking up different sounds. Yeah, but they must have a way of moving their tongue around their mouth to make some of those sounds. Oh, I'm sure they do. Yes, yes. The way we enunciate and speak our language is also, you know, unique and individual to individuals. But mm -hmm. um, it does have to do. And the other thing I've always found is that people who are into music often have an easier time understanding other languages. Oh, why is that? They, it's the the again that acoustic. Um, memory they're they're mm. used to tuning into sounds and tuning uh. into frequencies so they tune in to whoever's speaking to them and someone with a heavy accent they might pick up what they're saying easier than a person who you know is we could say tone deaf but that's not maybe polite however there are people who just don't have that acumen for hearing different sounds so would you say the U.S. Supreme Court is tone deaf? <laughs> they seem to be. They really seem. <laughs> this is to be not a political show, but <laughs> to what the uh, American public really wants. Yeah, I think we could say that. So where in Italy did you live? I lived in Milan most of the time. I ten and a half of the eleven years I lived in Italy were in Milan. So Milan near the church. The Duomo. The, uh, yeah, the big church. Yeah. I lived about 25 minutes outside of the center of town. So it would take me 25 minutes by tram to get into the Duomo. But every time I went past the Duomo, I would like force myself to stop and just look because I would think not everybody gets to see this. You know, it's like, it's so beautiful. It's incredible. Yeah, now like my background is Jewish, but you know, I love these big old churches. I like yeah. to go in them and just sit and look at all the stained glass stuff. Well, and it's, um, it's often right. cool. It's often a very cool place mm. to hang out in the summer because the, the thick walls insulate from the heat. Uh, yeah, and, right. yeah, sometimes when it was a 90 plus degree humid day in Milan, I'd just go to the Duomo and sit, <laughs> sit inside and cool off. Uh, a long time ago, I think it was uh, 2014 or 2015 or something like that. Um, I produced a conference in Milan, oh. and it, it was right around the corner from the Duomo at the Park um, Hyatt. Yeah. Okay, which is inside or next to that big shopping mall. The uh, Galleria. Galleria. Wow, oh, what a gorgeous place. Yeah. Yeah. God, it was great. Anyway. I um, miss it. So, I'd already been gone 10 years by then because I, I moved from Milan to Switzerland in 2005. So... By the time you did that conference, I was not there anymore. Could have used another registrant. <laughs> I would have loved to have attended, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Americans in Milan. And mm -hmm. do, do they have the same problem as people from another country coming to the U.S. and trying to figure it all out, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they... Um, they have to adapt to the culture. They have to adapt to the stores being closed in the afternoon, for example, which freaks a lot of people out. They're like, oh, what? Clothes are, stores are closed from, usually from about one to four is the, people call it the siesta. People actually are not sleeping in Milan anywhere. They're not sleeping. However, the day is is truncated. You People get their things done outside the house from about nine to one, which is lunchtime. And then they pick back up at around three to seven p.m. So it's a different, or four to seven actually. It's a different rhythm of life. So they have to adjust to that. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because right. you, you have things to do and you can't do them at night, or you don't want to because you're tired already. Uh, and that's how it works. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. One of the things that always fascinated me is that you know Italians do do activities after dinner. But their dinner is at eight. So anything they start as an extracurricular activity after dinner is at nine. And I would sometimes ask my students in classrooms when I was teaching in Milan, like, so what time do you go to bed? And they would be like 1 a.m. It was very common for them to stay up super late because they started these activities so late. And that for me was like something I, ne I could never do. I was Because well, you have to get to up at that. seven already, right? They have to be, well, they, the workday in Milan typically starts around nine. 
Mm. They're not eight to fivers, they're more nine to sixers. Mm -hmm. But another characteristic of life, business life in Milan that a lot of Americans have to adjust to is that Italians work quite late. It's not unusual for someone to call a meeting at 6 p.m. that then goes until eight or nine. And so they're known for working very late. And some, some people say it's because they're disorganized and they don't get stuff done during the day. But one of the things about Italian business culture is it's very relational. So if someone comes to your desk during the day and, and interrupts you, it's very rude to say, sorry, I'm busy. Like, I can't talk to you right now, right? An Italian will always drop everything mm. and have that conversation because for, in their world, they know that that relationship is important for them getting what done what they need to get done. So they'll always give preference to uh, talking and interacting with, with their colleagues. It, there's actually a word for it in Italian. It's called sempre disponibile. And it means I'm always available. Say that phrase again. Sempre, sempre disponibile. I'm always available. Sempre disposable? <laughs> disponibile. Yeah, okay. Disponibile, which means available. Sempre, sempre is always. And disponibile is available. Yeah. So now let's translate this back to the topic here of people coming into the U.S., in a business context, right. uh, to be a, an executive or a, a company. And right. Most, of, most company. of the people are Americans. Exactly. So if an Italian, for example, moves over here and starts working here, one of the things they have to get used to is not interrupting other people because we don't appreciate it. You know, we close our doors and to concentrate and focus. Yeah. And for an Italian, Actually, I have a friend who when she she's an American who was working in Italy and she would do that. She was in marketing in, a, in an Italian company and she would like close she would at lunchtime, she would go in her office, close the door and eat her lunch by herself to get some stuff done. And her boss actually came to her and said, you have to stop doing this because it's upsetting your colleagues. They don't they think you're rude. They think you don't want to have anything to do with them. So she learned that lesson, America to Italy, but an Italian might come over and be surprised that people are eating at their desks, that they're not taking time to have lunch together and to discuss and, and have a conversation. So that's something that they would have to adjust to for sure. Uh, another thing linguistically that people have to adjust to is that you know, they've been working in a multinational and possibly the language of that multinational is English. But when you're abroad working in an English language environment, everybody's a non-native speaker of English, right? It's like, oh, you've got a French guy and you've got a Spanish guy and you, or woman and you've got whoever, but all of them are speaking English as a non-native speaker. When that person then switches to an, a U.S. environment, all of a sudden they're surrounded by people whose first language is English. And they're probably speaking quicker. They're probably using jargon. They are probably being, you know, not being explicit enough to, for the, uh, the non-native English speaking person to pick up on what's really going on and, and what's being discussed. So that can be a huge shock. It's just, you, you sort of, they sort of have to get up to speed, I think. That's the way this this is really interesting because uh, there are so many businesses uh, that are bringing people into the U.S., Yep, lots. So, so that Europeans mainly, uh, mainly, although Asians, of course, too, but mainly Europeans. Uh, of course, it depends on the business, but uh, because uh, if you can be successful learning how the American economy works as, as an international, not as a U.S. citizen, but brought over to work and to live amongst Americans, that will help their career when they leave and go somewhere else. Yeah, that's true. And many multinationals have a policy that anyone who wants to advance in the company has to spend, it, sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's three years, but they have to be exposed to that uh, environment. 
I've just started uh, working with a couple of people from Whirlpool and Whirlpool headquarters are in Benton Harbor, Michigan, which is three hours west of where I live over on Lake Michigan. And it's a little bit the back of beyond, if you will, like it's, uh, it's on the lake, but it's not Chicago, it's not Detroit. Uh, it's, it's a small town, actually. And all of these international people have to shuffle through there, they have to spend their two years, if they are on a leadership track in that office. And in fact, I talked to a guy who is Italian, he joined Whirlpool in Italy, and then was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil for two years. And then he got transferred to Benton Harbor. And he said the problem for him was that his, he had been modifying his English down. He was in charge of EMEA, so Africa, Middle East, for the years he was in Brazil. And he had to um, modify his English to a simpler level when he was working in that environment. Then all of a sudden he finds himself one day in this very American environment. And he said, I really feel like I need to brush up my English and, you know, bring it up to speed again, because this is a whole different environment. Well, it's a, it's a farming, farming area then, isn't it? Rural. Um, well, I don't know if you'd call Benton Harbor rural because it's not very far from Gary, Indiana, which is highly industrial, but it, it is, um, it's not big city. Let's put it that way. It's a smaller city for sure. And Whirlpool is king there and has been for many, many years. So it's in some ways it's like the Whirlpool town, uh, but it isn't close to anything like Chicago, probably to drive into Chicago is two hours. Yeah. To get to Detroit is three. So it's just a bit off the beaten path, I guess I would say. So let's talk about that now, okay? Get these if highly educated, sophisticated uh, people within a business context and lifestyle context, right. and they go into Americana small town. Not easy. Where do you get a cappuccino in Benton Harbor? Well, I guess Starbucks. <laughs> I'm sure they have a Starbucks, but you're right. I, I think these, some people do find it. I, I, you know, some people may like it. Some people may find themselves in this more small town environment and think, wow, I love this. This is really cool. But I've talked to a couple of people who don't find it that way. They're just like doing time. They, they feel very um, uncomfortable there. And I think they hope that they can travel a lot that they aren't there so much. Uh, one woman I, I've been talking to, I know she's in Milan right now for a while. And maybe that gentleman, that Italian gentleman has to you know, travel around the world for his role. So they, I think they hope they don't have to spend a ton of time. But sometimes people with families actually like it because they found, find that small town vibe really great uh, for the family. Yeah, it'd be a safe area. Um, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> well, that brings to mind a topic like, are, are you providing your customers, meaning international people who come into the US and they need to fit in somehow or try to understand it? And there's violence in the news too much, of course. Um, and it's impacting people's sense of security and mental health. Oh, yeah. Sense of well-being. Is it clean? Is it safe? Am I going to survive this? Right. Or how do I get out of here? You know, I'm... is there an exit? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I just went to a, a Pops concert over Fourth of July weekend in Iowa because I'm from Iowa and we were back visiting family and we were invited to go to a Des Moines Symphony Orchestra Pops concert on the lawn of the Iowa Capitol. And it occurred to me, I actually thought maybe, you know, active shooter. I mean, it's, it, so it's weird that something that is so quintessentially American, like a Pops concert for the 4th of July, is a, something that you would actually think, my gosh, it could happen here. You don't know. So yeah, I totally get where you're coming from. And I think you're asking, like, I used to do a lot of intercultural training for incoming expats that I don't do that so much anymore, but I did a lot of it. And I actually researched gun ownership, for example, in Michigan, um, as opposed to in other states, I would try to help people understand the second amendment, why we have this issue, 
um, how scared should they be? You know, I remember a Chinese family once asking me, we want to go camping in Northern Michigan. Should we be afraid that someone in that campsite might have a gun? And I said, well, it's likely that they would have a gun if they're there to hunt or if they're there, you know, I mean, they do, people in Michigan do have guns, uh, but we would hope that they wouldn't be using them against people. But it is, um, it, it's culturally very, you know, all cultures are complex and difficult to explain, but that part of the American culture is, is challenging. It's very challenging to explain to foreigners, people who are not from here. Well, it's taking my breath away thinking about all this stuff here um, and what people have to go through. Because uh, well, it, it kind of, yeah, and it, it always amazes me that people want to become a citizen. You know, I, I have a Brazilian friend and her Ital husband's Italian, and they were just very excited because they just became US citizens. And I'm like, you really want that? <laughs> It's like, oh my gosh, um, there are safer places on the planet, you know, but for a lot of people who are not from here, they, they still see this as the best place to live. They still want to live here, raise their children here, send them to college here. You know, that's, um, it's, it's a different perspective. So uh, as we come, we're not at a close right now, but we're approaching the close because uh, we want to keep this as brief as possible without avoiding uh, without forgetting things. So right. have I forgotten something? <laughs> oh, I think we've had a, a really good conversation. Yeah, I appreciated yeah. it. Yeah. There are obviously lots of things that people who come here have to think about, but communicating in the office is one of them. And then, you know, the safety of your family is another. Let's go back to your time in Italy mm -hmm. and, uh, and Switzerland, okay, if it's okay. Sure. Um, when you went from Italy to Switzerland, uh, mm -hmm. what part of Switzerland did you go to? And did you have to learn a new language? I went to the German speaking part initially to live near Basel. Was, um, actually I was near, uh, closer to Zurich. I was Zurich. Okay. one hour East of Zurich. So uh -huh. I was in a small, a small city, a city of about 70,000 people called St. Gallen, which is very close to the Lake of Constance. And of course, the language in the German speaking part of Switzerland is German, but it's Swiss German. And I had studied German at school. I actually took five years of German in between high school and college. Mm. But Swiss German is so different from right from Hochdeutsch or, or German German that um, it was very confusing. And it was linguistically complicated because the Swiss typically don't like to speak German, even though they learn it, because that's all their schooling is in, in Hochdeutsch, or standard German. But at home, and even in school to some degree, they speak Swiss German. Uh, so, and they're not very willing to speak German. So I would like try to speak my high German with them, like if I were in a store or something. If they knew English, they would immediately respond to me in English. If they didn't know English, then they would like start to speak in high German, but then switch to the dialect, sort of even unconsciously after a few minutes. And then I was lost again because I, I understood, I could probably at the time understand 60% of what was said in high German. When it would switch to Stitzerdeutsch, it went down to 30%. I mean, it was like way lower. So that was complicated. It was yeah. difficult. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? Everything's so localized. Very. Switzerland is very local. Very, everything's very localized. So do you think people from that area, for instance, and when they come into the U.S., um, there is it high American or low American to be in Benton Harbor? It, I don't think we, <laughs> we don't make that distinction in our language. So uh, obviously we do have regional differences in the way that we speak English. But from a, the perspective of German versus Swiss German, it's honestly like almost a different grammatical structure. It's, hmm. it's really, really very different and especially very different sounding. So it's, it's, it's like, um, it, it is like dialect, like even where my cousins live in south, Southwestern Germany, which is near Freiburg, they all, they all know standard German, of course they're German, but in the home um, and in the community, they speak their local dialect as well. And that was much harder for me to understand when I was visiting my relatives. 
So, and, and they didn't necessarily speak high German because I was there. They, they continued their life in their dialect because that's, you know, it was my, my issue to ad adapt or adjust to that. This is really interesting uh, as uh, the world of communications brings us closer to the world. You would like to think so. And yet oftentimes it can be a barrier. You know, I can think of, of times in lots of countries where I sat around a table with native speakers, bored out of my mind because I didn't understand a thing. And yet, because I was the outsider and the foreigner, I couldn't impose, I wasn't gonna impose English. And in some cases, they, not very many people spoke it. So you, as an outsider, as someone visiting another place, you do find yourself on the margin. It's, you know, it's, and that's why if you're really going to live in a place, it's, it's so beneficial to learn the language because it opens the door and it lets you in. Uh, whereas if you never really do that, you're, you're, you're kind of forced to stay on the margins of the, of the, of the society. So this is Bolt Global, Barbara Bolt. And uh, check it out. What's your website? Uh, BoltGlobal.com. Hmm. Thanks, thanks for being a part of the Global TV today. Thank you for having me, Ed. And Great come on you. back in August if you have time. I would love to. Okay, we'll, great. Let's we'll continue this series. Absolutely. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks see so you, much. See you on the trail. Absolutely. Bye-bye. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> I'm trying to hang up here. One second. <laughs> you want me to?